so known as Zen in Japan, Chan Buddhism also developed in monasteries upholding strict monastic rules. Colonial European powers, of course, in the 15, 15, really 14, 15 through 18 and early 1900s, influenced, spread their influence throughout Asia and had an impact on Buddhism as well. We can sort of think about Buddhism under colonialism in terms of the decline of Buddhism, but also in terms of the way Buddhism responded to colonialism, which to me was a bit surprising to read, and a revival that it began to enjoy and is enjoying today. So many of the European powers, in fact, according to religion and globalization, all of the European powers basically stopped supporting Buddhism. The British in Burma, Myanmar today, India, Sri Lanka, Tibet and China, the French in Indochina, the Portuguese and Dutch in Sri Lanka and Indonesia, later on the Japanese, all acted to kind of disestablish Buddhism. The colonial European administrations stopped fulfilling the traditional monarch's role of being the patron and protector of Buddhism, so they stopped giving government support to monasteries. For example, the Portuguese and the Dutch took power in Sri Lanka in the 15 and 1600s. They destroyed monasteries, persecuted Buddhists, and they forcibly converted try, or tried to convert many people to Catholicism. The British ended government donations to the monasteries, and they also stopped supervising the standards of monastic ordina ordination so that there, were, there wasn't any oversight over who could become an ordained monk and who could not. And they also stopped public ceremonies giving respect to monastic leaders, sacred symbols, and temples. The colonial powers also brought in two other forces with them, Christianity and Enlightenment ideas. The materialistic, scientific notions of Western culture derived from the Enlightenment, science, technology, democracy, European medicine, all of these things were imported into Asia through schools built by the colonial governments and offered a challenge to Buddhism. The book makes the claim that European medicine was effective where traditional Buddhist rituals were not effective, or at least had unpredictable results, and that that pre presented a challenge to Buddhism as well. After 1949, the Communist Party in, in China attempted to destroy Buddhism, destroying mon monasteries and disestablishing Buddhism even further. According to the writers of Religion and Globalization, however, Buddhists recovered from and responded to these challenges in different ways. They maintain that few people actually converted to Christianity despite the big push that the colonial powers made. They also write that Buddhist intellectuals engaged in dialogue with science and Christianity. The writers give an example of a series of public debates in Sri Lanka between Buddhist intellectuals and Christian missionaries, and the Christian missionaries lost, so that helped to restore public faith in Buddhism. Reformers who wanted to bring back Buddhism and, and restore it tried to get lay people more involved so that eventually lay people, ordinary householders, working families, were able to become supporters of the monasteries in place of the former royal patrons. So the monasteries began to regain support from lay people, but in turn, the lay reformers insisted that the rules of the monasteries be revived and more strictly observed. And they also wanted to, re to revive monastic meditation practices European attitudes toward history and historical research also prompted both Europeans and Asians to investigate the history of the Buddha himself, to try to learn more about his, his real life and his teachings, to, to try to get to the, the core of his actual teaching. And so publishing the teachings of the Buddha and works about the historical Buddha also helped to revived Buddhism in, in the post-colonial period. Reformers in Thailand, for example, taught that Buddhism in its pure form was not concerned with rituals or cosmic power, 
Buddhists themselves began to reject those aspects of Buddhism that had become what could be called superstitious or magic or ritual and to emphasize more the individual quest for enlightenment and mental cultivation. Also, Europeans became more sympathetic to Buddhism because they saw in Buddhism an alternative to the dogmatic monotheism of Christianity. They understood Buddhism as a philosophy seen as ancient wisdom, amazingly preserved through history and still ex ex accessible. So Westerners, disillusioned with Christianity and its blind faith, found an interest in Buddhism as a kind of an alternative. In the post-colonial period, in some countries, Buddhism also became kind of caught up or related to a greater sense of national identity when, when Asian communities were throwing off the yoke of colonialism after the Second World War, Buddhism helped some of them to regain a sense of national identity. Today, Buddhists around the world are re-engaged in the crises that are facing our planet, environmental destruction, political corruption, global hunger, responding to catastrophes, social transformation. Buddhists today seem to be making an effort to reclaim the riches of their tradition in response to social justice and social needs so that, so that rather than fleeing from suffering or fleeing from the world in order to attain enlightenment, Buddhists today want increasingly to reach out to alleviate the suffering of others. This iconic photo of a Vietnamese monk committing suicide as a protest in the 1960s against the government's failure to respect Buddhism is a well-known symbol of engaged Buddhism today. Various Buddhist societies, like Soka Gakkai International, help with relief efforts in the face of disaster, such as the hurricane that struck the Philippines in, in such a horrible way last fall. Buddhism in the U.S. could be said to be on the rise. My own familiarity is with the Buddhist Midwest Buddhist Temple in Chicago, an offshoot of a Japanese school of pure land Buddhism, part of the Mahayana branch. We will visit on Sunday, March 23rd at 8.30, from about 8.30 to 9.30, and participate in their meditation. You want to dress nicely but comfortably. If you feel comfortable, you can sit on the floor on cushions that they will provide. We will take our shoes off to go into the sacred space. And the meditation is a combination of, of just sitting, but guided by a leader, restful, meditative, walking around the sacred space. And if you choose to participate, offering incense to honor the Buddha, the the reverend of the Midwest Buddhist temple stresses that when we offer the incense, we're not worshiping Buddha. We're really just thanking the Buddha for his teachings and for the guidance that they offer. So I, as a Christian, feel that I can participate in that ritual, whereas I don't feel that I could participate in the ritual of, of puja to Krishna, for example, that we experienced when we visited Dr. Shah's house in Chicago. This is a story I like. It, to me, kind of captures some of the differences between Buddhism and the West, particularly Christianity. There's a story in the Gospels about Jesus saw a funeral procession in which a mother who was a widow had lost her only son. So he goes over there and basically brings the kid back to life and restores him to his mother and makes her happy. This story is, is parallel, kind of similar, but the outcome is different. A mother came to the Buddha and she was sad because her son had died. So whereas Jesus resurrected the son, the Buddha preached a sermon on anicca, impermanence. The idea that nothing and no one in the world lasts. So we can't cling to anyone or anything. We have to be ready to let go. And the woman went away serene and happy. Here's a journal entry some of you have already completed. How would you describe Buddhism to a person who had never heard of it before? So write a cogent paragraph. Cogent means forceful and unified, effectively communicating. Compose an original and meaningful main idea and include at least three supporting details. Cite at least one source. A citation for the book 
religion and globalization is here in the notes portion of the second slide. Religion and globalization, world religion and historical perspective. The authors are John Esposito and others. Oxford, Oxford University Press, 2008.